He's worthy to be praised. He is worthy. Whether we feel like it or not, He's worthy. Whether we've had a rough week or not, He's worthy. Whether we feel like we've been done wrong, He's worthy. Whether somebody hurt our feelings or not, He's worthy. See, there's no place in your life that you can get to that God's not worthy. You can't get so low that He's not worthy of your praise. Paul and Silas were thrown in prison not for stealing, killing, robbing, or preaching the word. They were beaten. Many stripes laid upon their back. Thrown into prison, their hands and feet secured. But I believe Paul and Silas looked at each other and said, you know what? He's still worthy. Because the Bible says at midnight, woo, they begin to sing praises unto God. Don't tell me how bad you got it. Tell me how good your God is. It may be bad right now, but God's still good. It may be tough right now, but God's still good. It may not be going your way, but God's still good. And He's still God. And He deserves our very best. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to be a cheerleader this morning. That's not my job. I'm a preacher. But I cannot and will not go to church and not engage God. I'm sorry. If that's your style, I am not the preacher for you. I have to engage God. I will say stuff that I probably shouldn't say from the pulpit. I done been preaching too long now. There ain't no sense in changing. But one thing, I love God and I'm going to engage Him. And that is the call that He placed on my life was to get people back to engaging God. It took me a long time to know what my real purpose in being called to preach was, and being a pastor. But it's to challenge people to get back to the place of worship. It's so easy for us as Pentecostals to go through the motions and lift our hands and say hallelujah and there would be absolutely nothing in it. Why? Because it's just routine. It's what we do. Oh, praise the Lord. And absolutely no heart in it. Absolutely no real worship in it. And that becomes normal. Oh, well, I got an amen from sister so-and-so. Oh, we had church today. Did we experience God? Did we experience His presence? That's what we're going to deal with today. Did we have an encounter with God? Or did we just go through the motions? Amen. If you have your Bibles with me, I'll be preaching out of Isaiah chapter 6 today. I'm going to start in verse 1. Thankful that God has gifted Wesley with such a gift. Those intro videos for our sermons that we played the last two weeks, Wesley has designed those, made those, and done everything. Um, amen. So uh, he, he stepped in my office and said, the video that I made should have cost us about $300, but I was able to do it for free. And uh, with the graphics and the... Uh, so he's doing a fabulous, fabulous job with those. Amen. Are you ready for the Word of God? Amen. You going to help, Pastor? Y'all don't leave me hanging today. Amen. If you do, I'm going to preach to 1 o'clock for meanness. Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved, shook at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Then said I, here am I, send me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the anointing that flows just by reading your word. I ask you now, God, to anoint these lips of clay to speak your word to your people today as you have given it, Lord. God, I pray that you touch the hearts and minds of every person that is watching or is present in this service today to receive from you what thus saith the Lord. Clear minds, clear hearts, open ears, ready to receive what thus saith the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I want to preach to you this morning on the thought, here am I, here am I. This text starts off dealing with in the year that King Uzziah died. So I want to give you a little background on King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a man that became king at the age of 16 years old. When he was 16, he became king over Judah, and he reigned for 52 years. So he was a very young man when he became king over the nation of Israel, and he reigned 52 years. And according to the scriptures, Uzziah started out his rulership going to the priest of the Lord, Zechariah, asking for guidance and asking for wisdom and according to the word of God, Uzziah did what was right in the sight of God. Uh, he said he did what was right in the sight of God and God blessed him. If folks would start living right, you would start getting blessed right. I'm, I'm going to say that again because folks in the back didn't get that. If folks would start living right, then you would start getting blessed right. Amen. When you do what is right in the sight of God, it releases God to bless you. You can't be over here shacked up with the devil, playing patty cake with God, blowing kisses at God on Sunday, but expecting to live in divine favor and divine blessings all, all, all throughout the week. When you start living right, you start getting blessed right. And I'm not talking about you got uh, to wear this and wear that. That's not what I'm talking about, living right. I'm talking about when your heart is consecrated to God, you are living according to the word of God, you forsake all other things and he is first in your life and you strive daily to live according to his will. You strive daily to live according to his purpose and to walk out the calling that he has placed on your life. That's living right. We, we want to make living right a set of rules. We want to make living right a denomination. Living right is a relationship with God. Because I promise you, when you are in right relationship with God, if you are doing something that you should not be doing, God has a way of letting you know. 
You don't need someone to come over thumping you on the head with their Bible saying, oh, you should not be doing that because I'm a firm believer today that if a person is living in sin, they already know. Because there is enough power in the conviction of the Holy Ghost to, to let somebody know that they're living in sin. People may say, preacher, you don't preach on sin enough. No, I preach on relationship. Why? Because if you get right with God, then the sin in your life, watch this, because Jesus said, if you love me, what? You'll keep my commandments. In other words, when you are in relationship with Jesus and you are in love with God, then you want to live right. But we're trying to make people live right who ain't in love with Jesus. So no, I don't preach a lot about sin, but I preach about relationship because when the relationship gets right, the sin takes care of itself. Amen. Some of you are staring at me like a calf in a new gate. That's all right. We have taught rules instead of relationship. We have taught theology instead of relationship. We have taught de the denominational doctrines instead of relationship. And that's why we got so many messed up people. They believe a certain way. They live a certain way. But they have no idea why. Why am I doing this? Why am, I, why am I living like this? Why can't I go do this? Why can't I do this? Why am I wearing this? People have no idea why they live because they don't have relationship. Because we teach rules over relationship. Let me move on. He started out doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And God blessed him. Second Chronicles 26 and 5 says, Long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Let me, let me back up. Long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Prosper means you are blessed above and beyond. You're living in prosperity. People say, oh, are you one of them prosperity preachers? I'm not a broke preacher. I'm sorry. If you think you got to be broke, crippled, and crazy to serve God, that's not the same God that I serve. That's not the same Bible that I read. When I live for God and I seek after God, God makes me prosper. Amen? Amen. You want to get your bills in order? Start living right. Why? Because lack is always a sign that God's trying to move you. Lack don't come from the devil. Lack comes from our disobedience to God. Oh, I don't got to preaching now. How do you know lack is a sign God's trying to move you? God sent Elijah to the brook. But all of a sudden the brook dried up and he began to be in want. It wasn't that Elijah was, uh, Elijah, God sent Elijah there. But God was trying to move him. He said, arise, go to Zarephath, because I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you there. Lack began when God was ready to move him. Amen. Are y'all okay? I know I'm hitting it hard and heavy, but I got a lot to cover. So here is Uzziah. Became king, 16 years old, reigned for 52 years. Started out doing what was right in the sight of God. God blessed him. God made him to prosper. But over in 2 Chronicles 6, uh, 26, verses 16 through 21, Uzziah got kind of puffed up. You know, it's a thing when God blesses you, you get too big for your britches. Some, God don't bless some people because they can't handle the lack with dignity and respect. What makes you think God's going to let you be blessed Walk in prosperity and favor and all that, and it puffs you up. Isaiah became so puffed up, the Bible said that he went into the temple and tried to burn incense before the altar. Now, this was a job reserved only for the priest. Only the priest could do that. Only the priest could do this. Never let your position make you think that you can do stuff you weren't called to do. He was not called to be a priest. He was the king. Never, But he thought his position whoo, gave him the right to disobey God's will. Let, let, me, let me help you something. God has a order. Are y'all tracking with me? God has a will. And 
be, just because we are successful or we have position, let, let me bring it on down to the church. Just because we have position in the church does not mean we have the ability to defy God's will. Our position never gives us the right to defy God. Okay? Let me talk to some of that may be watching online, some pastors that may be watching online. Your position does not give you the right to defy God's word. So you can go out and marry same-sex couples if you want to. Your position gives you, does not give you the right to defy God. Amen. You can continue to, to have false prophecies, to, to, to do things and get money and all that, but that does not give you the right to defy God. Your position does it. There's so many people using their position in defiance to God. And you say, well, preacher, that's been that way for years. Yes, and the church has paid for it. Preacher, it's been that way for years. Yes, and the body of Christ has paid for it. How do you know that? Are y'all okay this morning? Watch this. How, how has the church paid for it? Are y'all ready for this? Watch this. When Uzziah went into the temple, he defied God's will that only the priest could burn incense. This was an act of disobedience. Watch this. The priest came in and told Uzziah, said, you're out of order. Uh-oh. See, we, we don't like preachers to do that anymore. We don't want nobody to tell us we're out of order. We don't want nobody to tell us we're out of line. Preacher, that's not your job. Your job is to marry my kids and bury my dead. Your job is not to bring order. Your job is not to bring, uh, you know, to tell us that we've done something wrong. That ain't your job, preacher. We go to Oprah and Dr. Phil for that. Woo. So watch this. The priest told Uzziah, said, you are wrong. You need to stop doing that. And it made Uzziah mad. This is straight out the book, guys. And the Bible said, while he was wroth. In other words, while he was angry with the men of God for telling him he was wrong, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Are y'all tracking with me? Preacher, we've had leadership that has defied God for years, but yet you say, and we say, what's the big deal? But you say, preacher, it has hurt the body of Christ. Here's why. God shows us right here. The Bible says that when brethren to dwell together in unity, and right, it's like the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard to the skirts of the ground. The reason so much ran is they anointed you with five and a half quarts of oil. Are you tracking with me? This sets a precedence that anointing flows from the head down. Are y'all with me? The anointing flows from the head down. That's why you can't submit yourself under just anybody because you're saying when I submit to them, I want what's on their life to pour into mine. That's why I don't let just everybody lay hands on me because I don't want them transferring what's on their life into mine. I'm very peculiar about who I let lay hands on our members here. You can ask any of our security team that helps me in the altar. I will let them know, don't let so-and-so lay hands on nobody. Sorry. Why? Because I don't want them transferring that spirit onto anybody in our church. Woo. Let me get back up here. So watch this. We know that the anointing flows from the head down. When leadership gets out of God's will, disobeys God, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Leprosy is a disease. When we disobey God, instead of the anointing flowing, disease flows. Whew. That is why, oh God help me, we have so many sickly, diseased churches because leadership defies God so that the money keeps coming in. And instead of the anointing flowing, disease is flowing. 
And we have so much wickedness and disease creeping into the body of Christ because leaders have forsaken what thus saith the Lord for what thus saith the Benjamins. That's why I have told our board I will always keep a job outside the church because I will never allow my salary at the church to cause me to even think about not saying what thus saith the Lord. Because I've seen too many preachers that preach the word of God and got run off. I will always keep a job. Why? Because I like to eat. I'm sorry, I'm considered full-time pastor, but I still work part-time. Why? Because I'm keeping my foot in the door somewhere because I will not compromise what thus saith the Lord for a paycheck. Amen. I never will. I never will. So watch this. <laughs> when we start disobeying God, oh, i got to hurry. Disease begins to flow. So here is a leader over the people of God and instead of the anointing flowing, disease is flowing. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? So we have diseased leadership flowing into the people of God. And God begins to call forth leadership that says, we can't have this. I, my, it is not God's intention for our churches to be diseased. It is God's intention for our churches to be a city set on a hill that gives light to all who are in the house. Come on, are y'all tracking with me? So God begins to call forth leadership to lead the people forth and out of this and thus the call of Isaiah. So I wanted to paint the picture of what was going on at the time God calls Isaiah and says, it's time for you to rise up and declare what thus saith the Lord. Doesn't make you popular. Do you know that there were prophets in the Bible that were continually rejected? Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Why? Because no matter how hard he preached, folks wouldn't change. No matter how hard he, he brought forth the word of God, I want nothing to do with it. Nah, you, you, Jeremiah, go on. Everything's good. Why are you coming making waves? Why are you coming trying to challenge us to change? I've been serving God 40 years. Don't challenge me to change. It's worked for me this long. That's why we have churches that are four or five funerals from closing. Woo. People say, how y'all get all them young folks coming to y'all's church? Because it's alive. It's alive. Man. I don't want to go to dead church. I preached at a church years and years ago. When I walked in, the piano player was sitting at the piano with an oxygen tank beside the piano. And he was playing the piano, sucking on some oxygen. And he looked at me and said, this is a social security church. I said, I believe you. They said, do you want to go to that church and pastor? I was like, no. Why? They're going to all be dead in a couple of years. Let me move on. <laughs> Y'all think the same stuff. I just say it. <laughs> My wife tells me sometimes after I get through preaching, she says, you don't have to say everything that pops in your mind. I can't stand her. I love her, but I can't stand her. <laughs> the Bible says. <laughs> so here is the state of the people of God. And God calls forth Isaiah. This, and we read in Isaiah chapter 6 where he's calling God, but this wasn't Isaiah's first call. Isaiah was actually called before this, but... He gave God every excuse why he couldn't, why he wasn't qualified, why he wasn't this and that. 
And so as Isaiah hadn't accepted his call yet, but the Bible says in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. In other words, when disobedience in the body of Christ dies, then the door is open for the glory to be seen. We pray, God show us your glory. We sing, God show us your glory. We, we, we shout out loud, God show us your glory. But the glory will not be seen until disobedience dies. When God says go, we go. When God says do it, we do it. When God says walk in it, we walk in it. Instead of being like, well, we could, but we tried that, but I don't think that's going to work, but when disobedience dies in the body of Christ, then we can see the glory. There is no chance of experiencing the glory while we're in disobedience to the will of God. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? You say, well, we ain't shouting this morning, Pastor. We should be. No chance of experiencing the glory as long as disobedience to the will of God is present. Not only in our churches, but also in our personal lives. As long as disobedience to the will of God is there, we won't see the glory. We won't walk in that level of glory. We won't walk in that level of blessing. Oh, God, there's more that you want me to do, but I just don't have time to do it. You'll never walk in it. Oh, God, there's more that you want me to do, but we're going to let these young folks do it. You'll never walk in it. Oh, God, you call me to step out on faith, but I'm just worried. You'll never walk in it. When God tells us to do something, it's not a request. God don't request us to do nothing. He commands. When you pray, when you fast, walk by faith. Those are not requests. Those are commands. Bring your tithes and offerings. That's not a request. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's not a request. Bless them that despitefully use you. Bless them that curse you. That's not a request. Go out into all the world and preach the gospel. That's not a request. Are y'all tracking with me? All these things that we love to talk about and preach about and shout about are not requests, they're commands. And if we are not doing those, we are living in disobedience to the will of God. And when we live in disobedience to the will of God, we cannot experience the glory of God. No chance until we're living in obedience to the will of God, to the word of God. Let me move on. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he said, I heard the seraphims crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What does that mean, preacher? That glory's all around us. Glory is all around us. We just got to get to the place we can see it. Oh, God. Word came to a king that the man of God was knowing what he said in his bedchamber and telling Israel of his plans. He would set up traps for the children of Israel and God would speak to the man of God. Watch this. What the king was saying in his bedchamber and the king called all of his closest guys in. He said, which one of you is betraying me? Which one of you is telling me, telling the enemy where our traps are? And they said, King, none of us. But there's a man of God in Israel that knows what you're saying in your bedchamber. 
and he warns the people of God. And he said, go out and get him. Are y'all tracking with me? They found out where he was. They surrounded the place where he was. And the man of God's servant went out and seen them surrounding him. And he comes back and he says, what are we going to do? They know that it's you that's been telling all the king's plans. What are we going to do? We're surrounded. The man of God looks at him and says, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And he prayed. All right. And he prayed and he said, God, open his eyes that he can see. And the Bible says it was as scales fell off his eyes. And he looked. And even though they were surrounded by an army, they were also surrounded by horses and chariots of fire of God. And the man of God said, I look into the spirit and I see that glory is all around us. And even though the, the, the servant couldn't see it, the man of God said, open your eyes for glory is all around us. God has us. They that be with us are more than they that be with him. We pray and sing, God, show us your glory. But we fail to position ourselves to experience the glory. God, show us your glory. Mm -hmm. God, show us your glory. Mm, look at her. I was going to buy that same dress from Cato yesterday. I'm glad I didn't. Mm, there he goes again. I don't know why that preacher preaches in blue jeans. He don't wear a suit and tie. We could get more people if he would just dress right. I don't know why that preacher has to meddle so much. If he would just preach and people would shout, we'd be busting at the seams. God, show us your glory. But oh, I cannot stand this song. God, show us your glory. But why they got to have that guitar? They got to have them drums so loud. They got that boy up there with that ponytail lead, hip and lead. Come on. Oh, but God, show us your glory. God, we want to have an encounter with you. But oh my God, if this preacher don't shut up, my roast is going to burn. All the chicken's going to be gone off the buffet at Magnolia Grill time we get there. Because then Baptists going to get out at 12 o'clock straight up. But, oh, God, we want to see your glory. We want to see signs and wonders. But, oh, that preacher took 15 minutes to do announcements this morning because he was trying to get us to worship God. Don't he know I'm not going to do it regardless? I just go to a Pentecostal church because it's what I'm used to. But don't get no Pentecost going in here. Come on. Oh, gosh, there's so-and-so with their hands raised again. People don't know what I know about them. I had a 30-minute gossip session about them last night, and I know some stuff. Maybe they're raising their hands to try to get free from that. Maybe they're lifting their hands because they know they need a Savior to come in and change their life. Who does that young preacher think he is? I taught him Sunday school. <laughs> Y'all responsible for messing me up like this. <laughs> Can't blame nobody but you. <laughs> Amen, I'm going to get up. God, show us your glory. But think about it. What mindset do we come in God's house with? What attitude do we come in God's house with? We can't have drama five minutes before service starts and then expect the glory to show up. Well, I don't like that song. Tough. Because we ain't doing it for you. You're not doing it for me. We're doing it for him. It's not about what we want. Well, I don't like that kind of music. I don't like this and I don't like that. 
But God, we want to see the signs and wonders. But don't ask me to engage God. Don't ask things to be different. Don't ask me to be stretched out of my comfort zone. Don't ask me to, to actually have to participate. Can I, can I, spoiler alert? Worship is not a spectator event. Worship's not a spectator event. And I'm sorry, if you don't participate, we don't get participation trophies. You get what you put out of it. Can I tell you something? God's here every service. The glory's here every service. And if we go home unchanged, it's nobody's fault but our own. Amen. If we go home unchanged, it's nobody's fault but our own. I'm not being ugly this morning. I'm trying to challenge us to say there is so much more that if we would get past ourselves and tap into. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. Watch this. I got to hurry. The glory shook the temple. In other words, the glory shakes things up. Many people don't want the glory because it shakes things up. Many people don't want the glory because it can't be contained. It can't be controlled. Watch this. There are three aspects of the presence of God. I got so much to tell you this morning. We may go over 12. I'm sorry. There are three aspects to the presence of God. There is the anointing. There is the presence. And there is the glory. The anointing, the presence, and the glory. Most of us inside the body of Christ rest in the anointing. Period. We don't go any further than the anointing. The anointing gives us the ability to do certain things. The anointing gives us influence. Oh, I love it when sister so-and-so sang. She's so anointed. That's influence. It is the anointing. It is the presence of God. But if they can sing and make you shout, they have influence. Are y'all tracking with me? And most of us never get past the influence of the anointing to even get into the presence. Whew. Because we aren't taught to go further than the anointing. Oh, we just need your anointing. No, we don't. We need the glory. Oh, we just need your presence. No, we don't. We need the glory. But many people don't go past the anointing. Why? Because the anointing leads to the presence. And then if the presence is received and handled properly, it leads to the glory. How do you, how do you know all this, Pastor? Most get hung up on the anointing. Why do we not want to go past the anointing? Are y'all ready? Because... The glory causes leadership to disappear. The glory causes leadership to take a back seat to the presence of God. And too many pastors and leaders are so insecure that they're scared if they disappear, they're going to lose position. So thus we don't step off into the glory because it makes leadership disappear. How do you know this, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Exodus chapter 33. Moses is up on the mountain with God. God's speaking to Moses, and Moses is speaking to God. Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments. Moses makes this statement. He says, Lord, don't take your presence from us. And God responds to Moses and says, wherever you go, my presence will go with you. Are y'all tracking with me? So Moses is in the presence of God. And Moses says, I can't, I'm not going nowhere unless your presence is with me. And then God says, all right, Moses, wherever you go, my presence will be with you. And then Moses says, God, one more thing. God, I, I, I thank you for your presence, God. God, I thank you that your presence is going with us. I thank you for these laws. God, I thank you that bread's falling out of heaven and water's coming out of a rock. I, I thank you that our clothes are growing and shrinking with our bodies. But God, there's one more thing. And Moses says, God, show me your glory. God, show me your glory. And God says, Moses, no man can see my face and live. He said, but there's a place by me. 
And the Bible says that God put Moses in a cleft of the rock and put his hand over him. What happened? Moses disappeared. When the glory manifests, leadership disappears. And the Bible says God put his hand over Moses and he walked by. And Moses got to see the hinder parts of God and his glory. Oh, God, show us your glory. The glory shakes things up. Haggai chapter 2 says, Yet it once is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the dry ground and the seas. God said, I'm going to shake it all up. And when I do, the glory of the latter shall be greater than anything you've ever seen. Are y'all tracking with me this morning? The glory shook the temple. And when all this was happening, Isaiah wasn't out booking revivals. He didn't go live on Facebook. He didn't start a whole nother church. When the glory began to manifest, Isaiah said, Whoa, it's me, for I am undone. In other words, Isaiah was like, Oh God, oh God, I've seen your glory. And it has shined a spotlight on my inadequacy. The glory reveals our inadequacy. We think we got it all together. Man, most of us can have a church service with our eyes closed. And people go home and write comments on Facebook. We had church today and God not even show up. Why? Because sister so-and-so sung her song and it's going to make brother so-and-so shout. You had that beat going and somebody was toe tapping. Amen. The guitar hit a good uh, rip and, every, and a couple of people's like, yeah. That'd be me. <laughs> but the glory reveals our inadequacies. We think we got it all together. We think we got everything that we need to, to serve God and to live for God and all that, but then the glory shows up and we realize how little we really are, how little we really know, how little of the presence of God we've even tapped into. Woe is me, for I am undone. You see, Isaiah had been telling God of all the reasons why he couldn't. Can I help you today? You can be flawed and still hear from God. You can be flawed and still hear from God. This young man that I was talking about earlier, he said, I need to hear from God, and I can't hear from God. I don't feel like my prayers are being answered. I said, get in his word and let him speak to you. He said, I don't know how. I said, ask God to speak to you through his word. Start reading the word, and God will speak to you as you read those words. People say, well, God don't speak to me. I'm like, read your Bible. 66 books of God speaking to you. Hello? 66 books of God speaking to you. The Bible says, Isaiah is, woe is me. My inadequacy is in the presence of God. And the Bible says that one of the seraphims flew down and took a live coal from off the altar and brought it and touched it. To Isaiah's lips and said, Now your iniquities are taken away and your sin is purged. You see, it is the fire that cleanses us and sets us apart. It is the fire of God that cleanses us. And, and we say, Oh, we don't want that fire. Why? It's the fire that cleanses us. And some people will say, Well, we want the fire, but we want a manageable flame. We want a flame that we can turn on and off when we want to. We got visitors today. Let's don't make it too, too lively today. We can't expect to have the fire of God every service. Why not? We can't expect folks to shout every service, Pastor. Why not? 
We can't expect altars to be filled with people seeking God every service. Why not? Who said we couldn't? Show me in the Bible where it says we got to have a, uh, a, uh, a move of God every six months. Even a dead horse will twitch every now and then. We've been riding this same horse for years, preacher, and it's been dead for 30 years, but it'll kick every now and then, and we think we're having a move of God. You can cut a snake's head off, and it'll still move for an hour. Woo. Let me move on. Most of us want a manageable flame, one that we can turn on and turn off, but Deuteronomy 4 and 24 says, If y'all give me just a few more minutes. If y'all didn't hear what I said, even my mic knew it was 12 o'clock. Hey Amen. Give me just a few more minutes, please. Deuteronomy 4 and 24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. In other words, God's going to be a consuming fire. We got to let him consume us. And when all this is happening, Isaiah, Wesley, you can just stay with me up here. When all this is happening, Isaiah says, he heard a voice that said, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? See, they were more than just hunting someone to go. But hunting somebody that will allow God to equip them to go. There's a difference. There is a difference. And just going out and being equipped to go out. If I were to go out on a SWAT mission and I didn't put any of my gear on, any of my equipment on, it's very dangerous. My chances of success diminish. My chances of survival diminish. But if I put my equipment on that is designed for the job I'm going to do, I have increased my chances of success, my chances of survival. Are y'all tracking with me? Many people want to go out, but yet they refuse to be equipped to go out. Many people want to go, but they refuse to be equipped to go out. Amen. Much better. They refuse to be equipped. Who will go for us? Think about that. Who will go for us? That question is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God talking to each other. Who will go for us? One God existed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Who will go for us? If God was talking to himself, why would he say us? Who will go for us? In other words, who will go in our place? Second Corinthians 5 and 20 says, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador has no opinion of their own when they go into a meeting. An ambassador says, this is the opinion of the government I represent. Are y'all tracking with me? If we are ambassadors for God, when we go, it's not our opinion, it's not our ideas. It's this is the opinion of the king that I serve. This is the word of the king that I serve. This is the law of the kingdom that I belong to. Adam was the first ambassador. How do you know Adam was an ambassador? You can have five minutes, five minutes. Adam was an ambassador, why? 
he was the representative. God wanted Adam to rule the world the same way that Adam ruled heaven. But Adam committed treason. Why? Because treason is the only crime, only crime, that carries with it the certain penalty of death. Go look it up in your law books. Treason is the only crime that carries a certain penalty of death. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely what? So when Adam sinned in the garden, it was more than sin. He committed treason against the kingdom of God. Because he was not supposed to have an opinion of his own. He was supposed to have an opinion of the kingdom for which he was a representative. We are ambassadors of Christ. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Here am I. Send me. God, I'm completely surrendered. I'm completely consumed. I'm flawed, God. But I'm consumed by your fire. God, I don't got it all together, but I'll go. I'll say what you tell me to say. I'll do what you tell me to do. I'll be submissive to your will. Send me. And I believe that God is sounding a call because we have had so much disease flowing into the body of Christ. We have had so many people compromising the word of God that God is calling forth leaders today that will say who will go for us? Who will go as my ambassador? And the call is today what will your response be? Who will go for us? I don't care if nobody ever knows my name. I'm not in a popularity contest. I don't care if I ever get to preach on TV. I don't care if I ever get to preach anywhere outside of Life Church. As long as people know who He is. As long as people know who He is. I don't want our church to be a church that says, Come see our children's program. Come hear our singing. Come see our greeters. Come hear our pastor. I want it to be come see Jesus. Come experience Him. We got a come see us mentality when it needs to be come see Him. Who will go for us? Send me. Send me to the broken. Send me to the hurting. Send me to the sick. Send me to the bound. But if he's going to send us, we got to let him equip us. And he equips us with his glory. Would you stand with me? Here am I. Send me. Take the hand of the person sitting next to you. I know I went a little over today and that's that's okay. Here am I. Are we really, really ready to say, God, consume me. I'm tired of offering you excuses. I'm tired of offering reasons why I can't. I'm tired of offering all the the reasons that, well, I've tried this and I've tried that. God's not concerned with that. He's concerned with, here I am. Here am I. He's not asking you to be perfect. We just found out we can be flawed and still hear from God. He's not asking us to be perfect. No person was ever perfect except Jesus Christ. But He is asking us to be willing to say, Send me. Send me. And as you hold that person's hand to you, bow your heads with me.
God, I don't got it all together. But I'm willing. God, I don't know how it's going to work out. But I'm willing. God, I may be misunderstood. But I'm willing. It may not make me popular, God. But I'm willing. People may not shout and dance and throw money when I say what you tell me to say. But I'm willing. That has to be our prayer. And I want us to have corporate prayer today as we close this service. That God, I'm willing to go do what you told me to do. Equip us. Father, we come before you today thanking you for the mandate, not the request, the mandate, the command that we have to go out and to preach the gospel to every person. To go out and share the love of Jesus with every person. Equip us today, God. Help us to go beyond the anointing. Help us to handle your presence the right way. God, when we handle your presence, it needs to be not my will, but your will be done. God, that we honor your presence. We cultivate your presence. We place your presence at a high priority. And God, when we handle your presence properly, then we can step into your glory. God, let us be a church and a people that experience the glory of God. God, I'm so tired of just going through the motions. God, just week after week, experiencing the anointing, experiencing even your presence, show us your glory. Let us experience your glory to go out. Answer that call. Whom will you send? Who will go for you? I will. I will. And I believe there's people in this house this morning that will say, I will. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. Send me, Lord. Send us, God, as you equip us to go out, to reap the harvest, to be a people that will stand boldly and say what thus saith the Lord. God, I bless every person that is here in the mighty name of Jesus. God, that you let your face shine upon them, that you give them peace, that you bless their coming in and they're going out. Everything, God, that they put their hands to will prosper. And I speak to every assignment that the enemy has against them. And I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. As shepherd of this house, I take the authority in the mighty name of Jesus. And Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. God in the mighty name of Jesus I bless your people to go forth in anointing and power and in glory use us oh Lord for your purpose we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus everybody said amen amen God bless you this morning